This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to Tau Unbound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. I'm your host, Ido Aharoni, and today it's my distinct pleasure to host a person that I call a friend, Professor Moshe Tzviran, the outgoing dean of the Faculty of Management and the head of the Center for Enter- Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you, and friend is a good definition. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm so happy that you're here because we've known each other for quite some time, but I never really had a chance to have a conversation with you about what you do academically, scientifically, and also in the world of business. And I know that you are a very accomplished business person and also a very accomplished academic. One of your big projects is is the the new home of the Faculty of Management, which started under your leadership. Uh, but before we talk about all those things, tell me a little bit about your background, your name, Moshe Tzviran. What is the meaning of Tzviran? Uh, I'll give you the long answer. I'm an only child of parents who basically survived the Holocaust, uh, came uh, separately to, to Israel. My mom, my late mom, Uh, came together with Yaldei Teheran, which was a delegation of orphans from Siberia all the way to Israel uh, in 1943. My dad uh, survived the Holocaust also in Siberia. He was the, uh, expelled to Siberia by the Russians, and, uh, which, by the way, is his luck. But uh, he survived, and he came here in the, right after the, uh, the independence war. And uh, they met here, and... The fruit is a one child. Uh, my dad came with his original name as Tzvirn. Tzvirn is like a, a, a red thread, okay? And uh, pretty much like all the new immigrants, they wanted a new uh, identity, and they were kind of requested also to change the names to more Tzabarik uh, names. So he decided, you know, just to uh, change the punctuation. And leave the source, but not the same pronunciation. So the Tzviran became Tzviran, and I was born as Tzviran, and I'm proud to hold this name. So, so uh, the, the thread uh, insinuates that the family had something to do historically with the garment industry? Honestly, I have no clue. My history starts with my parents because everybody else were gone. Uh, I never had the chance to have a grandparent, so I don't really know the history, and... It was kind of banned to speak about the ancient history, which means anything before 48 uh, at our home. So your parents as uh, survivors and, and obviously as refugees, because they don't not only survived the Holocaust, they became refugees because of the Holocaust. That's right. Uh, so they did not want to talk about the past. Uh, but what was their connection to 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 the to their past? Did they ever mention where were they from? Ah, no, no, I know the history. They were both born in Poland, in different sections of Poland, but both were born in uh, Poland. Uh, they lived there happy, by the way, uh, until the, the uh, Nazi invasion. Uh, and then they were lucky enough to be in the, you know, I'll call it, quote, unquote, the lucky part, or the, the good part, uh, under the Riventrop-Molotov uh, uh, agreement, and they... belong to the, the the place belonged to the Russian part uh, so they avoided the the Nazis they they partially avoided the Nazis because uh, my dad's family uh, part of them stayed there and you know the the, 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 the agreement was not kept so soon after uh, whoever stay, decided to stay there uh, was basically exterminated but uh, my parents were expelled uh, separately of course to To Siberia uh, and uh, the strong ones survived well their parents uh, did not survive others did not survive my mom became a ledger mom at the age of uh, 15 to her young uh, uh, siblings that's life and when they came to Israel where did they build their home my dad started in Petah Tikva my mom started in Jerusalem she was in Jerusalem in 48. Uh, under the siege and so on and then she moved to Tel Aviv 
to a one it's not a one bedroom apartment it's a one room apartment that held basically uh, held uh, six uh, female orphans uh, in something that I don't think that the human being deserves to live there but that was the beginning of their lives and uh, slowly slowly they so started they, rebuilding so they built their family in Tel Aviv yes you you were born in Tel Aviv I was born in Tel Aviv and um, practically in Bellinson but yes I was born in Tel Aviv okay so <laughs> technically in Petah Tikva it's like me I yeah. was technically <laughs> born in Yafo Right, I was technically in born Donolo. in uh, what was called then the, the, the Jani. Yeah, okay. And, um, and so you, you grew up in Tel Aviv. Yes. And when was your uh, moment that you knew that what you're going to do is what you're doing today? And I know that your, your connection to the, the world of business comes from your expertise in everything that is cyberspace. That's quite complicated. Okay, so, so the, the, the answer is in my 30s. But, uh, you know, going to the background, I, uh, you know, I, I'll share with you an anecdote. I, I studied in one of the uh, uh, schools in Tel Aviv, Yoroni Daled, and my dad was very keen about me becoming an engineer. Okay. Uh, he wasn't uh, uh, so precise about we, what kind of engineer, but he wanted his son to become an engineer. By the way, I should say that whatever I am now pretty much can be attributed to my parents because my dad was uh, all about education. If, you know, my, my kids and then my, now my grandchildren joke when, I, uh, when they bring a test and it's 80, 98 and I ask why not 100, but that's what I heard at home. Okay, he was about uh, educational excellence and he wanted me to become uh, educated, something that he missed uh, due, <coughs> sorry, due to the war. And um, so, so, you know, I did not fulfill, uh, I think, his wishes and I went to study uh, math and computer science. Okay, it was like more, uh, you know, we're talking about the 70s of the previous century. So it was more like not becoming an engineer, but something that looked like the, the, the next generation. So I studied my math and computer science, and actually I started working in this area uh, for many years. And during my work, I also uh, pursued my uh, Master of Science in Management. Uh, I didn't want to take an, a master's in computer science, but I wanted to do something more practical. I'm practical in nature. So I went to the School of Management and uh, basically acquired the Master of Science. And I continued working. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, as a decision, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I had a, a, a relatively good uh, master thesis and I said, why not pursue a PhD? I had no clue what it is, by the way. <laughs> you know, it just looked like a natural connection uh, and continuation. So uh, I, I talked to, my, to the faculty here. I already taught at the time. I was a teaching assistant and then I gave some lectures. And I said, I, I want to pursue an, a, a PhD. And they said, okay, but you need to quit. At a certain point of time, you need to quit work and you need to dedicate uh, what, we, what we call here to dedicate your body to science. <laughs> Which basically suggested that uh, after a couple of years, you know, the, the general studies, I left everything. I uh, got the blessing of my wife and I pursued my PhD. And during this time, I really liked what I saw. First of all, I liked research. Secondly, I was lucky enough to be a member of a very strong a team at the uh, School of Management. Uh, it was one of the largest as well, the team of information technology. And I think that at that time I realized that I don't want to go back to business. I would like to stay in academia. And by the way, it means that you need to make a kind of a family sacrifice because by the, by the time I finished my PhD, I already had a daughter. Uh, and just one at the time and uh, the family sacrifice means in, in, I would say in, in, several, in several areas first of all you need to uh, compromise on salary salaries in academia are not what you can get when you go abroad especially if you're a good computer scientist and especially if you have a, a master's or a PhD and uh, secondly it means and uh, by the way it's true today as well if you pursue your PhD in Israel and you want to go to academia, you need to 
uh, take a, a postdoc or, or a position abroad to avoid the risk of inbreeding. You need to see something else. You need to know people. You need to know the community and so on, so on which is, by the way, a very wise decision. Uh, but it led me to move to California for uh, several years. Uh, I left my parents here as a lonely child. Uh, it was not fun for them. Uh, it was fun for me, by the way. I, I enjoy California. But uh, we decided to come back, and then I paved my way to the Israeli Academia, and I'm here since then. And what was your PhD about? My PhD was about uh, strategic planning of, inf of information systems. The idea at that time was that people don't strategize for information technology or information systems, but rather they take what is offered and they build systems but have, that have no relation, first of all, to the business strategy, and secondly, they don't strategize IT per se. So that was my uh, uh, so, dissertation. So let's let's <coughs> try to simplify this. It's a very interesting concept. So let's try to simplify it. So when you say strategy in the context of information systems, what do you mean by that? The, if we're looking at strategy in general, the idea is what you're going to do. Shall I start maybe with what you're not going to do? But what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and what do you try to accomplish? So when you come to business strategy, it's clear. What do you need for your uh, uh, business to strive and succeed? Information technology is basically to support the business. It's not a business per se. It's, it is to support the, the business. But in many cases, and especially, remember, we're talking about the 80s of the previous century. In many cases at that time, uh, you basically focused on what the, what the manufacturers suggested to you. There was not enough expertise or knowledge at that time. Okay, even the, the, the term information technology was not coined. It's information systems. You bought systems. You either bought a piece of software or a piece of hardware, not necessarily together, and you tried to build something that has not necessarily has something to do with the well-being or the success of the company. So my dissertation focused on this. We, you know, I was naive enough to think that I may be in a position to offer uh, a, a, a generic uh, approach that will fit all kinds of organizations and drive them to, uh, to design a system that will match the organizational strategy. By the way, it doesn't work. Uh, it, it was good as an academic drill. I even published some papers, but in reality, to, you know, today I, I matured a little bit to understand that it doesn't work. And, you know, I will even quote uh, one of my professors uh, who unfortunately died uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Professor Philip Endor. Uh, and, you know, he, at that, at that time, you know, I, I consulted with him. He wasn't my advisor. And he looked at me with his wise eyes and said, listen, Moshe, What you're doing is great, but let me tell you something. If you think strategically, it's enough. Not necessarily you need to build a methodology and a planning method, uh, system and so on and so forth. You just need to think strategically. And I looked at him and said, listen, you're going to ruin my, dis my dissertation. Uh, so I did finish my dissertation, and I don't know whether he was or wasn't my own, my, one of my judges. But uh, in practice, he was right, by the way. And by the way, I, I can tell you from, I mean, I'm not a computer expert and I know nothing about information systems or um, I see, especially in large corporations, a disconnect between the employees and the people that work for the company that's supposed to push and, and communicate the product or the service and the strategy of the organization. And, and, and I wonder, maybe you can share with us, what's the reason for it? Why is it so difficult to keep everyone in sync on the same page, um, you know, adhering to the same principles? First of all, if I would have had the answer, I wouldn't be in academia. <laughs> Secondly, uh, I, I think that the, the probably the problem is management. Okay? Now, unfo undoubtedly, the larger companies have a strategy. They know where they are. They think they know where they are going. In many cases, they will take a, a, an external entity that will help them to strategize and so on and so forth. The problem of management here, especially in larger cor uh, corporations, is, not, is that what the board of directors and top management and maybe one level down know 
does not disseminate to all levels of the organization. So, uh, I, and I must admit that I'm not so sure I know of any single company, definitely in Israel, but, but abroad as well, that had either departmental meetings and or, you know, kind of a business unit meeting with each and every employee sharing with them, hey, these are our principles. This is what you are going to do. This is what this particular unit is supposed to accomplish. This is you part of the big picture. And that's how we're going to do it. I can tell you, by the way, there is uh, one case study. I may even revert from what I said earlier. There is a case study developed at Harvard talking about the Japanese train uh, company and about a, a, a service provider that is supposed to clean the train. In three minutes, clean the train. And this is basically the raison d'etre. This is why they exist for. And each and every uh, uh, male or female who works for the company understands what they need to accomplish, how they need to accomplish it. Actually, they are part of the strategy because they even say what they think should be done in order to, to, improve. to improve it and in order to accomplish it. So, But it, it is definitely... Uh, evident in smaller companies. When you talk about multinationals and conglomerates and so on, it requires a lot of effort and understanding that if the single individual knows why he exists, what is his role, then quite likely the company will be more prosperous. Now, the great Peter Drucker said once famously that culture will eat strategy for breakfast, meaning, um, you know, as much as we try to train people and teach them and, and, and speak to them on a rational level. At the end of the day, it's the, everything will have to be within the cultural context of that particular culture. And so uh, what would you say are the cultural characteristics of the Israelis that serve us well when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship? And what are the elements that don't serve us so well? When you talk about entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, it's a bit easier because everybody, especially when you talk about startups and even a bit larger companies, everybody understands, you know, we think they are there for the exit. No, they are not there for the exit. They are there because they understand what the company stands for. They understand what success stands for. Even the, the individual uh, uh, programmer understands that he needs to do something in order for the product to survive and strive. And they, by the way, none of the startups have a clear strategy. On the contrary, they are <clears throat> kind of moving from one purpose to another because that's a, that's a life of startup until you hit the nail on the head. So, and that's a, the reason why they succeed. If you go to larger companies... Uh, you'll find that not necessarily a, a good startup develops into a great larger company. There are some, as you know, nice and others, but not necessarily uh, 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 the, the culture that was, or the, 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 the lack of culture that was evident uh, at the startup stage works in favor when you grow up, when you grow as a company. So, and uh, by the way, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, Peter uh, Drucker is not here for like almost 30 years. I was lucky enough, by the way, to hear him uh, get a lecture from him when I was already a, a, a lecturer myself. Peter Drucker was something. But uh, uh, let's say uh, 30 or 40 years from now, uh, nobody will say Moshe Zviran said. So I do agree to many of the things that Peter Drucker said. Uh, I disagree by, to some of them, by the way. But he wasn't in Israel, by the way, because... Culture, its strategy, okay, for breakfast, is definitely true in Israel. Because the Israeli culture is what exactly makes startups successful and what makes things more complicated when you talk about uh, uh, grown companies. It's, our culture is unorganized. Uh, you know, we take it maybe even from our uh, uh, military service. You have ad hoc problems that you need to solve. And you look, if you look at strategy, you know, we're not, we're not that good in strategy, even with the IDF, but we really know how to solve problems. This is exactly the startup nature. 
Right. And and do you think that the, <clears throat> the reason why it's so difficult for us with long-term strategy is because we always have to deal with threat and crisis? Probably. Probably. This is one of the... We were grown like this. Okay? But we also, you know, we're also... We're not educated to, we are accustomed to uh, uh, outsmart the system. Okay, in many countries you won't outsmart the system. We are very keen about not working by the system. We are very keen not working by the rules, redevelop the rules. Okay, and I'm not talking about politics now. But we want to redevelop the rules and let's say a nice thing about us. That's what makes this country so great. Okay, you challenge everything. You know, uh, um, um, as one of my uh, roles now, I'm uh, heading the Bloomberg Segal uh, Center for City Leadership in Israel. It was established by the uh, Bloomberg Foundation and the Segal family, but the basically the, the, the roots came from the Bloomberg Harvard uh, uh, initiative that worked already for six years. And I was there in... Uh, in July of last year, and I attended uh, the, the uh, opening session of the sixth class now. And, you know, it took them, there were 20 mayors from the U.S. and 20 mayors from global cities. Most of them are large cities, unlike Israel. And uh, it took them time to, you know, to slowly open up, ask questions, start with questions, and, and develop a, a, a discussion. And I told them, the, the guys from uh, Bloomberg, hey guys, uh, we have a cultural difference. And they looked at me and uh, soon uh, after, in, in October, we had our first session here in Israel with 20 mayors. And, you know, before the, the lecturers started speaking, they started asking questions. We challenge everything. This is something I like, by the way. And uh, they, they were, by the way, the, the, the guys from Bloomberg were astonished. Okay? That's a cultural difference. We ask questions, we challenge, we try to find solutions out of the box. We don't work by procedures necessarily. I don't say it's always good. But it gives us our uniqueness. And the fact that the, lo the locomotive that drives the Israeli economy is high-tech and startups and informal and so on and so forth, not necessarily operations, not necessarily manufacturing, is exactly due to the nature of the people here. And and as obviously as the, the head of the Center for Entrepreneurship and, and Innovation, uh, you can attest to that firsthand. So tell us a little bit about what is being done um, at the university level um, while you were wearing the hat of the Dean of the Faculty of Management in, in your current position. What's happening in that field of the enhancement of entrepreneurship and innovation? You want the long version or the short version? <laughs> well, we have all the time in the world. Perfect. <laughs> uh, so, um, let me start with a fact. Since 2006, uh, Tel Aviv University is ranked, uh, until this year, as number eight in the world in producing uh, entrepreneurs who raised uh, money from VCs. I say until this year, because this year we climbed to the one step up to, and we're now ranked seventh. And Tel Aviv University is the only one outside of the U.S. in the top 10. Now, you know, even this is not necessarily a good reflection of reality because the top four are unmovable. It's Harvard, not necessarily in the right order. Yes, Harvard, right. Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, you don't touch them. If worse come to worse, they will interchange among themselves, but not nobody will hit the, the top four. So we're competing about the rest of six. And we're number seven, so it's not that bad. If we're great, we can make it all the way to five, not more than that. Now, what's the reason for... The reason, what's the reason for Tel Aviv to excel so much in this department of the amount of money raised for, for companies? We have the best students. We have the, a very good education system. And more than that, it's the nature of the people that we get here that are curious. And, you know, there, there's a whole lecture I can give you about it. But, but generally speaking, remember, our students, even at the undergrad level, are relatively old compared to their counterparts abroad. And they are mature, you know, after the army service and after the trip abroad and so on and so forth. Uh, 
and they understand that they can do something that will change the world. And many of them try. Now, despite the fact that about 90% will fail, they are not afraid of failures. This is, I, I don't know even how to translate it to German or Japanese. Okay, the, the Japanese used to, to, to do harakiri when they failed. Israelis fail. And some of the greater successes in, in startups are by entrepreneurs who failed once or twice or thrice. And they came back, stood on their foot and started another one. So uh, they are daring. They are daring as they are being taught to. Plus add to it the fact that, you know, we get the best here at Tel Aviv University. Location doesn't harm us. You know, it, it, it's much better to be in Tel Aviv than being uh, stuck in the Galilee right. or... The, the, the association with the Tel Aviv ecosystem. With the Tel Aviv ecosystem, with the military ecosystem, everything is around the, 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 the central part now. So that's number one. And uh, the fact that, by the way, you know, to, to, to pay justice, Israel is the only country, remember our size, we're 9 million. Well, typically, as I refer to us as a mid-sized Chinese city. Okay, we still have five universities in the top 50. In addition to Tel Aviv, four more others are in the top 50. So it's not unique to Tel Aviv. Yes, we are the best, we excel and so on and so forth. But five Israeli universities are at the top of the list. That's amazing. I think it's an amazing achievement. So uh, I think it's a combination of the nature of our students, the nature of our faculty, and uh, not more than that, you know, if you look at the ecosystem. It's supportive. Uh, but by the way, you know, if I'll, I'll try to give you another aspect of this. The, if you look at the literature on entrepreneurship, typically to have a, a successful ecosystem requires three components. Any two will not suffice. The first is the university as a source of talent. The second is the, the, the business, okay, the business uh, uh, environment that supports both in funding and in knowledge. And the third is a government. And you know, if I want to joke about it, if they don't want to help, at least don't do any harm. Okay? Uh, our government, by the way, is very good at this. You know, with the, with the uh, uh, multiple, uh, I would say the multitude of programs and the chief in, uh, 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 scientists at the point, now the, the Innovation Authority and so on, they are trying, actually they are trying to help. And you know, this is a locomotive, I understand them, it's a locomotive that drives this economy. But, but generally speaking, if you look at uh, the Silicon Valley, Harvard and, uh, sorry, Stanford and Berkeley are the feeders of this industry. Uh, Route 128 in Boston is Harvard and MIT. If you look at Israel, in, at Israel, it's not necessarily Tel Aviv University per se. It's first and before it's the army. So we take those that graduate the, the military service they ha that have the academic qualifications. So all you need is, you know, just to shape them, equip them with the knowledge, they'll know the rest. Right. And the army the israeli army when it comes to especially your your area of, of specialty which is cyberspace um is really unprecedented in the amount and and high level of skill of young people that they produce um basically they give them to uh to the israeli industry for free yes right someone goes through a technology unit in the idf And then instead of, you know, earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a, a year, as they would in other countries, they, they earn 700 shekels a month and then they go to work for, or they go to Tel Aviv U or they go to work for, for a technology company. That's, that's an unprecedented system. Doesn't exist probably in any other nation. So first of all, you, look, you can look at the army also as an education system, which is good. And they, <clears throat> I think that technologically, They are at the forefront. We are more here at uh, looking at basic science. We are more here looking at, uh, at applications. They are there at the forefront. And, uh, you know, I was once in a, in a discussion with one of the units, no matter which one it is, and they were looking about retaining people. And they said one of the things we can retain people is that we tell them this is one of the very few places that you can hack to other uh, systems, nature, uh, nations, and so on, and it's legal. 
<laughs> okay, and so so, uh, so but but you know, look, I, I fully understand because you you invest in them, and uh, typically they will serve more than three years, but not for a lifetime. But then you get a new generation, right? And you get new capabilities. Now that that brings another interesting question. You know, I I my specialty is is uh, I deal with the issue of how do you improve the positioning of places, which many people use the word branding. And so I, I often look at the list of the largest brand names in the world. And what you can see when you look at the top 100 brand names is that the uh, United States is dominating the list. Makes sense. Uh, you don't see not even one Russian name on the list, which is interesting because Russia is not a small country. There used to be... Uh, uh, one vodka brand, but it was purchased by the French. Uh, but you see a disproportionate number of Swedish names on the list, which is very impressive because Sweden is almost <coughs> the size of Israel. It's a bit bigger than Israel, but not dramatically bigger than Israel. And certainly academically, I think we're doing better than Sweden. Question is, how come we don't have an Israeli global brand, globally recognized brand, and what needs to happen in order to make that a reality so that we're going to have a, 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 an Israeli company that is so big that will be recognized globally like a, like a Facebook. And so your question has two sections and the answer to both is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know let's I, give it a try. I, I I'll try to improvise something because first of all there are names that you know they, they are not like Coca Cola known to everybody because due to the nature of the product. But if you look at uh, 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 companies you know such as Checkpoint, right? They are globally recognized. The first firewall and so on. They're globally, but it's a limited community because they are not into fast moving uh, consumer goods. Or in 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 uh, I don't know whether I can call it AKI as fast moving consumer goods, but yes, they are moving fast. But but generally speaking, they are more specialized. Now remember, you know, I don't think there is an individual, probably definitely not in the Western world, that doesn't know what a discon key is, and all of them are using it. I would guess that about ninety percent, you know, I'm generous. It's probably more. Don't even know that it came from Israel. Okay, so M Systems was acquired by SanDisk, and more know about SanDisk or now Western Digital than about uh, M Systems. What I'm trying to suggest is that uh, Checkpoint is an exception, maybe, because most of the companies that could uh, uh, achieve a realistic uh, uh, position in this uh, list uh, have been acquired by global companies. And uh, that's number one. Number two, you know, they are not, um, again, to, to my view, they are, we're, we're, you know, we're talking about the big Israel and we are basically a, a mega power in startups and technology. Don't forget who we are. We are an isolated island stuck somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, I, I would say that a, a nice proportion of the world don't, don't even know where are we on the map? So we are not necessarily in the position to produce a global name such as Ikea or Nokia. And you know, if Ikea is still here, but if you look at Nokia, it was a name that everybody knew and today not necessarily this is the case. So I don't really know what can make a, an Israeli company go from a, a great to excellent or from good to great. Yeah, I, w I was mostly, I'm sure that they're all excellent. Um, I was mostly referring to the scale. Uh, I mean, obviously, Teva at one point was the biggest uh, manufacturer of generic drugs in the world. Don't let me interfere. If you, We have no doubt that most of the people in the Western world take drugs. Most of them don't have a clue right. that it was produced by Teva. Right, right. Okay? So even Teva, when it was at its great times... Yeah, it was not a consumer-facing brand. And Pfizer, it, the, the first time they became a well-known uh, brand is Viagra. It's COVID. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> it's COVID. <laughs> COVID. First of all, Viagra refers to 
half of the population. And you know, if you look at the ages, no, it's it, it, basically it's a it, it, it vaccine against uh, COVID. All right. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the future uh, because, um, you know, our audience is very much interested in where do you see the future of of the of the university of your faculty um, what needs to happen and make it even better than what it is today and we and as you mentioned we ranked in certain criteria number seven in the world so uh, to this one I'll give you the, the longer version because I think it's important to our uh, audience and definitely to Tel Aviv University I mentioned that we were uh, uh, positioned for many years as number uh, eight and in producing uh, uh, entrepreneurs who raised money. Now, this was at the time where Tel Aviv University didn't do anything proactively to enhance uh, entrepreneurship. We were all about education. You know, uh, it is true for most universities, but definitely for our universities as well. When you take an undergrad on his or her first year, we think that this is a future researcher. We teach them how to do research where in many cases they think differently. They think about employability. And in many cases in Israel, they will also think about my new venture, okay? Because they saw their friends, their brothers, their siblings, and so on, doing something in this arena. So for many years, I tried to, to, to try and push to do something more proactively towards entrepreneurship innovation on campus. Now, uh, one trigger was that the, the Council of Higher Education uh, basically supported a few entrepreneurship centers in some universities that, that happened about four years ago. About three years uh, ago, uh, President Porat, president of Tel Aviv University, uh, took office and I knew him from previous work and we chatted about entrepreneurship in at Tel Aviv University. And I basically, I, I think I, I was... Uh, pretty explicit about my dissatisfaction, why we don't promote it. And he did what most of us do. He said, you know, Moshe, let's form a team or a committee, as we call it, to look into it. And uh, he assigned a few people and we worked on, on this one. But when we came to the, uh, to the solution, to the proposal and so on, we presented it to the, uh, the Holy Trio. The, the president, the rector, and the uh, uh, general manager, uh, they approved it because at that point it didn't require any additional resources in terms of money. So uh, I asked him what's next and uh, what are you going to do with it? Now, those who know Pre President Porat, he doesn't shove reports into drawers. If he thinks it, it, it is worth implementation, he will try to push for it. And we see many initiatives that are running now. And the bottom line was, he said, uh, I'd like to, to uh, uh, take it forward. Uh, you know, I'm joking about myself. I didn't ask for any title or any compensation. I said, okay, that's like the, the, the people of Israel. First we do, then we hear. So I said, okay, we will do it. And uh, what we are trying gradually to do for the last uh, couple of years is to build an, a Tel Aviv University ecosystem. Not, you know, we have islands of entrepreneurship across campus. When I tried to map them first, they were a double digit islands. We're trying to interconnect them on the one hand. And secondly, and this is happening already, what we are trying to do now is build a full, well-coordinated ecosystem where every student at Tel Aviv University, no matter whether he or she studies law or sociology or medicine, can take basic courses to understand the language of entrepreneurship and understand what it requires from an entrepreneur to move forward with a venture. And then in some of the schools, not all of them, but you know, we're young, it will happen across campus. Uh, they can also do what we call experiential learning. They can come with an idea or get an idea from outside and work on the idea all the way to the pitch. You know the pitches. So basically they do the market research and they do a pro proof of concept and so on and so forth and they pitch for it. Uh, as of October, we are three months down the road. We have already launched an accelerator, which basically suggests that those that come from those uh, uh, inter-school or inter-faculty 
uh, entrepreneurship centers with those uh, experiential learning experiences that are, look more successful, look more with chances to progress, get, by the way, the, these two, first two are for credit. From this point on, it's not for credit. It's if you are willing to go for your dream, we are going to provide you the platform. So the accelerator provides them with mentorship, with assistance from faculty if needed, with assistance from university, of course, if needed. And the idea is to take them to the next level up with outside ventures, uh, venture capital, with outside, outside uh, mentors, and of course, with internal Tel Aviv faculty, so they can then proceed either to raising money outside or much better to go to Tau Ventures and try to, you know, we complete the ecosystem by the startup competition on the one hand and Tau Ventures on the other hand. So we can give them basically a whole system. And, you know, the, the, uh, I would say, Mm -hmm. you know, in in, in many strategic, we're going to close the loop because in many strategic uh, 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 consulting, the question would be, what will be your uh, success photo? And I don't look for a photo, but I would like that the, when the pitch book ranking comes in five years down the road and we're going to hit number seven or six or five and you'll ask the entrepreneurs, where did it all start? The answer would be Tel Aviv University. Today, not necessarily this is the answer. Some of them that are on the list don't even know that they're on the Tel Aviv University list. They either came with a, with a military background or with an idea or whatever. Not all of them will say it all started here. There are a few. I do hope that five years down the road, not necessarily I will be here, but that a few years down the road, all of them will say, listen, Tel Aviv was, Tel Aviv University was a test bed for our ideas. We basically built our team here. We came with the initial idea, not, not necessarily this is the final idea, but we came with the initial idea. We got all the support we needed here. And the bottom line, this will become the Entrepreneurial University of Israel. Well, that's certainly a great vision for the future. I know that you're working diligently to make it happen. Unfortunately, uh, we have to end our podcast, although I could have stayed and, and listened and learned from you for, for a few more hours, definitely. Uh, obviously, we'd like to invite you again to continue this conversation. Let's compromise on five years down the road when I told you, about, where I'll tell you about the success. All right. So thank you so much, Professor Tzviran. My pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you and to our listeners and viewers back home. Thank you so much for being with us. And until the next time, goodbye from Tel Aviv. This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat.